So, I just want to explain a little bit about what I do, so you know where I'm coming from. I meet with uh, VIP patients, and you think, ooh, it's a VIP patient. Well, knowing Dr. Bennett and how innovative he was back years ago, he called his procedure the Vatacuti Institute Prostatectomy. It had to be an important, had to have an important ring to it. And thus it did. We had worldly patients coming from all over the place. And uh, it's known as the VIP in the VUI, the Vatican Urology Institute. <laughs> so that is an organization that's part of our hospital. So just to answer that question that you had, John, that's where that name came from. So what I do, I uh, meet with patients in their consultation. So patients have just been diagnosed. They then come see us. I sit down with that patient. I take a health history. I meet the spouse or the caregivers or the family. Um, I talk a little bit about what they'll expect, how they'll be in the hospital overnight one night. They will have no tubes or drains, and when they go home, they go home not with a penile catheter, but they go home with a catheter that's placed in the lower abdomen called a suprapubic catheter. So that being the innovator that Dr. Menon is, he said, I want to make this the most comfortable procedure that I can for our patients. And so he says, let me just put it into the bladder this way. It's an old standard technique that many urologists have done for a very, very long time. But this was something that no urologist would ever have considered doing because it was always thought that a catheter has to be between the bladder neck and the urethra so there's no constriction of those sutures. So we had a willing patient that was willing to try it. And he tried it, and it comes with a little clamp. And you turn the clamp on a certain number of days that pass by. On post-op day number five, I'm telling the patients you're gonna turn a little clamp, and then your bladder's gonna to start to fill, and we put you through a key test. Lo and behold, our first patient urinated no problem. There was no stent, there was no catheter through the penis in the urethra. We did that, we then had him open it to make sure his bladder was empty. And we did this over a two-day period. He did magnificent. And I took the catheter out and he thanked us for not having to have a Foley catheter in. And if all of you guys who have had surgery or treatments that required a Foley catheter, you remember the discomfort associated with that. Um, but anyway, uh, we've done this since uh, 2008 as a standard procedure now. Uh, very, very few patients will have Foley catheters. So, um, you know, I firmly believe in it, and it is definitely more, more comfortable for patients. So in the consult, I just lay out a plan for the patient of what's going to happen. Seven days later after surgery, I will be taking the catheter out. I am their post-operative nurse. After that point, I am then going to, um, I see them back at one week, I take their suprapubic catheter out, and then I move them right in to the penile rehabilitation as soon as we give them their pathology report. So once we deliver the news, usually people have fairly good news. It was contained, there was no lymph nodes positive, the Gleason score, either it stayed the same or it changed, the negative margins, we go into all those details. We make the patient feel fairly comfortable in that he's gonna be okay. And our take home message for many of our patients when we see them is get beyond the cancer scare Get beyond the surgery, you're going to be okay. Let's focus now right away on all the quality of life issues, okay? So that's when I say, this is what you need to do. This is the class that I've set up for you. Uh, this is your homework. This is your prescription. Either you're going to watch this DVD or you're going to come to one of my live classes that I hold regularly at certain points in the hospital um, in the week. I give them their lab requisitions for their PSAs. I give them their prescriptions for the Viagra, the vacuum pump, Cialis, whatever that we're going to get that patient on. And then, part of my job, and the job that I love the most is teaching and talking to the patients and having them handle the equipment and getting them familiar with how to use things for rehabilitation. Uh, so anyway, it's a unique job. If you ask any urologist in this country, if they have a nurse like me that does all this, Dr. Menon, he sits at the console, and I have to confess that I am known as a Mennonite. <laughs> a Mennonite. So I recently met with Dr. Sorensen in Windsor, and he had told me this, and I just said, you've got to be kidding. And just at, the, at, at work yesterday, one of the staff urologists who's um, notorious in our department for perineal prostatectomies, he says, uh, oh, I need one of your business cards. I says, oh, 
Kim is the one that you can direct that patient to. She handles your patients now. Oh, so you're just the Mennonite now? <laughs> That's what he said. I says, I guess it's just all over the place. So I don't even know if Dr. Mellon knows that yet. Hope he doesn't find this video. But anyway, um, go ahead. You can change the slide. I have a laser pointer way over there. Um, would you mind getting that for me, John? I'm so sorry, I forgot. But I wanted to just point out on the slide, uh, it's attached right on the side of my Milton bag, or my Milan bag, right there. That brown bag, bring that brown bag, nope, the brown purse, yeah, bring that over to me, John. Well, I'm colorblind, but here, this is what I want right here. Can we take that off for yes, Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm John and your woman's purse. Excuse me. That, yes. Well, while well, he's fumbling above there, <laughs> this transition, that, that the hospital made in, into getting you doing this, is it, is that a, a it wasn't overnight, it was a period of time, wasn't it? Right. What happened is the transition into my current role, it's a very unique role, and you have to have years of experience and trust in your current employees and what you do. What Dr. Menon has done is we've always operated on a team concept. Our team takes care of a whole lot of one patient, that one patient, when they come for a consult, they're going to meet the, uh, the first person that is the 1-800 uh, patient concierge or patient advocate, we call her. She gets the patient into our office. They then meet a concierge who talks to them about where they're going to be put up in their hotel and where they're going to get their food and, and makes them feel comfortable. She takes the spouses to different areas. Then they meet me, then they meet Dr. Menon after they meet the fellows and the residents. It's a big, a big teaching facility. We also have teams of the operating room staff where the surgeons are down there with Dr. Menon because robotic surgery is not for one doctor. You need a whole team from anesthesia to bedside assistance putting in ports. It's very similar to like laparoscopic, but you need assistance on the left, the right. You've got this big machine. You need your circulatory nurse, you need your scrub nurse, and then you've got your robotic surgeon on the console. So it's it's a lot of uh, resources that you need. Then there's the post-operative element, which is a significant amount of work. <laughs> so I'm dealing with patients' psyches. If you can go back to how afraid you were when you had catheters in and, and so forth, um, you know, I, I carry cell phones and I'm on call at home and I go to Windsor and if patients are having problems with catheters. And, so Dr. Menon saw how good I was. <laughs> And he just started slowly adapting me into taking care of these patients. And it's not that I was really good as a nurse per se, but just how I was handling that patient's psyche and how I was making them feel not only physically, but mentally and emotionally comfortable. He really, and I tease him, and maybe that's why we're called Mennonites, he really only has to sit at a console and do the procedure. His whole team just takes that patient and moves them right along. He's, he's rarely seen. He does a very good job at the, at the console, and he'll tell the patients that. And we get letters and all kinds of things that come back saying, that your team is wonderful, but because we've been together a long time. But these roles that I do, it's feasible for nurses who commit. And if nurses commit to learning and being innovative and being like me, not being afraid to, to, to do group sessions and teaching and things like that, you, you've got to take people that that are that type of person. And, and I do work with wonderful nurses, but a lot of them are, Andrea, how do you do what you do? He says, come on, I'll have you come down and teach class. Are you kidding? I would turn red with embarrassment. So it's not for everybody. But um, it's just something that I just got involved in. You know, so thank you very much. And I think, too, part of my personality is take charge attitude. Like, get out of the way, Dr. Men, and this is what I'm going to do, and you're doing it wrong, and you'll look at me. So I'm not afraid to tell him what I think. So he's like, well, if you think you're going to do such a good job, you do this. <laughs> so, all right, so this is an animated drawing of a bladder, right here, prostate, and this is the urethra, okay, where the penis the urine channel is. So here's a picture of prostate cancer. So this is what's removed, is the, the gland. Under here are cell vesicles, and sometimes we spare them and leave them, feeling, Dr. Bennett feels that sometimes sparing cell vesicles during the surgery might help with a man's potency or sexual function down the road. 
But most importantly, he developed the Veil of Aphrodite, which is something about a love goddess or something, right? Um, there's a, two nerves that run on the side and back of the prostate. So here's the standard nerve here, and here's the veil. So it's like a spider web mesh of, mesh of nerves that run on the left and the right side of the prostate. When you do open surgery, you're going by a feeling technique, whereas robotic surgery gives you that visible acuity to see what you're doing and, and what nerves to, to, um, to leave behind. And you can also see tissues when they look a little suspicious. Maybe you need to take a little bit more tissue and so forth. So what's removed is the whole prostate, the sumo vesicles, and some of these nerves, depending on where the cancer is located. Now, the reason men have incontinence, when you leak urine and you have you know, the ability to lack control of your bladder, there's two sphincters. There's one right at the neck of the bladder, and there's one right here, the apex of the prostate. So if you guys do a Kegel exercise, and you might have heard of those, or you might have done them before, the pelvic muscle exercises, you're exercising this area right here at the apex. The main sphincter, which is the involuntary sphincter, has been removed as part of the radical surgery. Okay? So, Luke, if you could go to the next one. So here's an example of what an open surgeon might be able to do, and that's giving you the, the main nerve sparing. You can maybe feel a lot where the main nerves are, and they leave those, but the veil has been removed. If the veil is removed, our experience is that it could significantly decline your ability to regain your potency by maybe 20 to 30%. 50% of the men that we tell have standard nerve sparing, as you see here, their potency is likely to be um, okay within a year to two years. So there, there's rectal, uh, the rectum here, when a man sits, they might have a little bit of tenderness, and that's because the rectum is right there. Uh, but what we do, go ahead and advance that. He pulls the bladder down and he just ties things up right there. It's called the anastomosis, and it takes about six weeks to heal that up. And I always tell my patients when I take the catheter out, you may feel wonderful because you had the robotic surgery, but don't go being too aggressive with lifting, pulling, pushing, because what can happen are those stitches, and I've seen it happen, can tear. And you only know that when patients start complaining of some severe abdominal discomfort, vomiting, heavy blood in the urine, bladder spasms, those are the symptoms that we would see. Okay. And if that happens, we're putting a Foley catheter in, and that's what the patient didn't want in the first place. <laughs> so I always use that as a threat when patients start behaving themselves. And then after six weeks, they go ahead and they do what they want. I said, now you're out of the, you're out of the risky zone, so you're good. Any questions about this? Nerve sparing? Were you guys just curiosity? Did your doctors ever the ones that did not have robotic surgery had open surgery. Did your doctor ever say he was able to spare nerves? Did they talk to you about that? Yep. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. So once I've moved the patient past the um, catheter removal and uh, they're doing well, they're pointing on their own, uh, I get them into my class. Um, now, because I have a lot of global patients that come from different countries, different states, all over the map, um, it's not feasible for me to always do a class, so I made a DVD. Um, and the DVD is, is excellent, and it, it goes through the A to Z topics of the entire continents, penile rehab, and all of the instructions. So it's the exact same thing I do with the class, but a little more informal, more professional. When I do run a class with the patients, I like to joke around, I like to have a little fun with them, I like to make them feel comfortable, and I think that's what Jerry kind of identified in me over there, that uh, T. Andrea's got this personality in there, hidden somewhere. I think, I think she'd be good for us. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the topics that I discuss in the class is the first thing. When I get them there, I'll tell the guys, taking the prostate out or having treatment was the first step. And that was probably the most difficult thing to do. But I said, in fact, the most difficult thing right now is your healing. So I set expectations, and I tell these guys and the ladies, expect one to two years to completely feel like you've recovered. Okay. If you are not recovering, and I tell the patients by one to two years, if you have not feel, if you do not feel that you have fully recovered, there is still quality of life issues, whether it's bladder-related issues or whether it's your uh, your sexual function or erectile dysfunction. There's treatments for that. There's surgeries that we could do 
to help with your quality of life. So for instance, and I want to mention this because I'll get off on a tangent, if you have ongoing incontinence, for example, there's something called a sling procedure. There's an artificial urinary sphincter. For impotence, there's different penile prostheses. Okay? There's the less invasive type to a three-piece model. And I have worked with patients that have had these done and are very, very happy. I will share with you that my mother's husband was diagnosed with prostate cancer two and a half, three years ago. He had his surgery by a physician in Ontario and uh, was open surgery. And here his, you know, his wife's daughter is in this field and I'm trying to tell him, go to Hamilton, try the robotic surgery, you will do fine. But he's a hard-headed guy and he just stuck with a urologist locally that he felt comfortable with, had open surgery. And I'm not blaming him on open surgery, but he had some ongoing incontinence for years. And he went through several pads per day. So finally I said, look, you need to do something. So we set him up with a urologist that does the bladder sling. And it's an outpatient procedure. He's completely dry now. So He's like, wow, why didn't I listen to Andrew? I said, why didn't you listen to me years ago? <laughs> you know, but anyway, it was all personal choice. He did what he felt was right. But there are things that can be done to help you. So don't think that there's nothing to be done. His urologist would not tell him that information. He got it from me. His urologist would tell him, oh, well, you're only using one pad a day. That's OK. No, it's not OK. Would you want to wear one pad a day? No. I don't want to wear any pads today. I mean, but women have no choice, unfortunately. But anyway, so we won't even go into that. So I just want to share with you, there are things that can make a difference in your quality of life. So don't sit and stew over your outcomes when there are, you, you just have to go out and find the physician to treat it, because they exist. Yes? It's video information. Question. Yes. Uh, it's done in Henry Ford Hospital? Uh, the question was, it's done at Henry Ford? Yes, we do do it at Henry Ford Hospital. Um, but if you're looking in the Canada network, it's in, Hamilton. it's in Hamilton. Are you talking about the robotic or the sling? Or the the sling. Yes, London, Hamilton. You just have to find bigger centers and the urologist that will do this for you. You just have to go in there and say, I want to be evaluated for either a bladder sling or a urinary sphincter, and your urologist will take you through the little thing, and, and don't let them say, no, 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 just say, I want a referral to the best guy, and it could be Dr. Brock in London, it might be somebody else in Hamilton, I don't know. Um, Dr. Sorensen from Windsor will send his patients to Dr. Brock, I think, as he is in London, who does these. Stuff. How much does it cost to get done in you know, I, I'm not a biller, I really apologize, but, um, you know, I, I couldn't hook you up with the billing department, you can ask those questions. Um, we have uh, Dr. Peabody at Henry Ford, who's excellent. He, I sent him Dr. Menon's patients, the ones that are still leaking or dripping a little bit. Um, but all of our urologists are pretty good. Um, you have to find one that, you want to ask the question is, how many have you done? Okay. So experience, because when you're gonna do a sling, they have to know how real snug or loose or tight to kind of make this fit. And it's all in the hands of experience, because they don't want to do it so tight that you're in absolute retention and you can't urinate. So it's gotta be a, a good fit. So my, uh, my mother's husband actually had, uh, uh, was a guy in Newmarket, was a urologist in Newmarket that did his, and he's had a wonderful outcome. So, and I, I wish I had a name, but I, I don't, but I believe it was the Newmarket area. What is a sling? What is it? Yeah. A sling is a type of material, like a, a mesh, that is implanted to the iliac crest bones and it hammocks. Um, if you could go back to the bladder slide, one of them. Okay. It hammocks right under, um, from here to here, like a U. And there's a little small incision, well, it depends who does it, but there's a little incision under the scrotum to go in and plant it and, and just tuck it up. And then they send you home, and then you have uh, you have restrictions, no heavy lifting, pulling, pushing, same thing after robotic surgery or so forth, for about six weeks. No real stair climbing, um, jogging, running. Kind of have to just take it easy for about six weeks. So it, it is a little painful. And my mother, um, bless her heart, sent me the photo of my stepdad's rear end, all bruised and everything else. Is this normal? And obviously she had it up, and it was on the bed, 
sticker. I had sent a picture. I'm at work one day and I got this. I'm going, what the heck? <laughs> he got into my family. <laughs> so, okay, go ahead. So it's it, 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 it's a it, it's a daily procedure. No, it's a it's a it's permanent a, surgical procedure. But it's done. It, it, it's sort of like an outpatient. I mean, it's an outpatient. Uh, yes. Now, if you have, it's for mild incontinence uh, where you're not losing more than maybe a, you know, not more than a cup of urine a day or a couple pads a day. If you've got heavy incontinence or complete incontrollable, uncontrollable incontinence, then you would be most likely. Uh, informed by your urologist that you would need an actual implantable three-piece urinary sphincter 